Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Darren Reesberg. I'm the secretary here at the university. And it's my privilege uh, to welcome you to this very special event this evening on the art of innovation, diplomacy and deployment after Iraq with our honorable speaker, former Prime Minister of France, Dominique de Villepin. On behalf of the university, I'm truly honored to welcome him onto our campus. Dominique de Villepin is a key figure in the relationship between France and the United States, and our institution is proud to contribute to that relationship through a many number of initiatives, such as our center in Paris, our study abroad program, with the interesting fact that about 40% of all of our students who study abroad study in Paris, the France Chicago Center, and more recently, the establishment of the University of Chicago French Club. Here to introduce this evening and our speaker is the president of that French club, Yves Zuckerman. Yves is a fourth year majoring in political science in the college. Both French and American, Yves has been the president of the French club for the past two years and was instrumental in terms of the organization of tonight's exciting event. So with that, let me introduce Yves Zuckerman. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to Darren. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Mr. Dominique de Villepin, the former Prime Minister of France. But before I say more about our speaker, I would first like to thank our partners for their wonderful support and counsel in putting together this event. Tonight's, ev tonight's event is brought to you by the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, the Cultural Service of the Consulate General of France in Chicago, the France Chicago Center, the Alliance Française de Chicago, the Student Government Finance Committee, the Dean's Fund for Student Life, and Frédéric Lefebvre, National Assembly Representative for French citizens living in North America. We are especially grateful to the Consul General of France in Chicago, Vincent Floriani, here with us this evening, Dean Boyer, IOP Director David Axerod, and Ian Solomon, Vice President for Global Engagement, for their invaluable help. Tonight's talk is part of the Marianne Midwest Speaker Series, which provides a forum for prominent speakers from France to engage simultaneously with audiences in Chicago, as well as remote audiences across the Midwest. So tonight, via live stream, we are joined by our watch parties in Milwaukee, Minneapolis, and Kansas City. Bonsoir et bienvenue à vous. In the later half of our evening, you will all have an opportunity to ask Monsieur de Villepin your questions. To moderate our discussion, we are very glad to have with us our very own Steve Edwards, Executive Director of the Institute of Politics here. A veteran of Chicago radio and press, Steve has been with the Institute of Politics since its founding. And anybody, and I see many of you here, anyone who has been to an Institute of Politics event knows that Steve is a model of fairness and tact, and we are really thrilled to have him here tonight. So on behalf of all our partners, we are exceptionally honored to welcome this evening Monsieur Dominique de Villepin. There are very few politicians who have fashioned their entire, who have fashioned, <laughs> je finis et c'est à vous, je finis et c'est à vous. Surprise, he's here, that's already a good sign. So I was saying, there are very few politicians who have fashioned their entire life on the idea that to build a better world, one first has to thoroughly understand and respect its peoples and their differences. Dominique de Villepin embodies the spirit. He was born in Morocco and spent his early years in Latin America. He is no stranger to the US, having attended the French high school in New York. He also holds degrees from the prestigious French schools of Paris 10 Nanterre, Sciences Po, and INA. Author, lawyer, statesman, he has written around 20 books on topics ranging from history to poetry to contemporary politics. In a brilliant career as a diplomat, he rose to prominence through his work in Washington DC, New Delhi, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Paris. 
He's both a, a world traveler, but also an intense patriot. And as such, he launched into politics in the 1990s as the chief of staff to then Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alain Juppé. Two years later, he led Jacques Chirac's successful bid for the presidency. And in 2002, he became Minister of Foreign Affairs himself. And it is perhaps in this role that many of you here first became familiar with him. In 2003, tensions over the possible invasion of Iraq mounted among global leaders. And in February of that year, Dominique de Villepin delivered a historic speech at the United Nations Security Council, voicing France's opposition to the war. In his speech, he asked, to what extent do the nature and scope of the threat justify the immediate recourse to force? How do we ensure that the considerable risks of such intervention can actually be kept under control? It has been over a decade since the United States intervened in Iraq. Conflict in the region continues, and these questions are more relevant now than ever before. So we are thrilled beyond words to have Dominique de Villepin himself here to answer them once more in light of the international crises we as a world face today. So now, let us listen to Monsieur Dominique de Villepin. I feel a little bit like uh, Jerry Lewis at the beginning of a movie. The truth is I don't like compliments and I'm not accustomed to it. So I try to shorten a little bit the introduction, the very nice introduction of Eve. Uh, let me tell you how pleased I am to be here in this uh, University of Chicago and invited by the French club. Uh, they gave me the, the opportunity to have an open-hearted discussion with you I remember the time, almost 10 years ago, when I would not have been invited by the French club, but by the Freedom Club. So I'm happy to come this time, officially invited. If we look at the world, we see that the crises are, are piling up, retreats of troops are accumulating from Afghanistan to Iraq. Ukraine is again on the verge of violence, the negotiation with Iran seems blocked, the ISIS threat is still as high as this summer. And nowhere we see examples of international success. We are living in a very dangerous world. Some of you might think that the Western interventions are the solution. I would like to have a different view and to point out that they are in fact a great part of the problem. Um, and that far from spreading democracy, they put democracy at stake. Uh, I want to speak very openly and frankly to you about the dangers of these Western intervention. I want to do it because I believe in the strength of democracy when it is based on exemplarity, respect, and dialogue. I want to do it because I believe in the responsibility of our democracies in a world which is full of conflicts. The choice for me is not between blind, blind action or inaction. We can choose long-term political strategies. I believe also in the force of principles, which are the very heart of democracy. There are no solutions without legitimacy. There are no solutions outside of legality, and there are no solutions outside of the unity of the international community. But there is another reason. I know that the US and France are the key countries of this reinvention because of history, because of values, because of a unique and shared spirit of freedom. The United States have been the first full-fledged democratic superpower in history, and it is for the US a great responsibility. This means more accountability than other superpowers. This means no need to create a villain to be a superhero. The US and France share alone among the powers the belief of a universal progress 
based on the freedom of all men, we share a similar spirit, although with differences of appreciation and of experience. This is why we do have a responsibility and we need to, to be more imaginative, to take more initiatives if, the, if we want the 21st century to become the century of freedom. Let's start by a paradox which concerns the Western interventions. The interventions of the two last decades are always military successes, but always also political failures. True enough, all interventions have been military successes. The intervention in Afghanistan allowed in a few months in the, in the winter of 2001 to break Al-Qaeda command chain. The US Army conquered the whole of Iraq and Baghdad in less than a month, in part to its own surprise in March, April 2003. The level of casualties on the American side has remained low through the war with 4,400 American soldiers killed. That's 12 times less than in Vietnam. This shows overwhelming military power Western countries do have today. They still represent half of the world's military expenditure, and the US, Great Britain, and France are yet the only powers in the world that do have a, a projection force capacity. The United States has even proven able to wage two wars at the same time, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And they dominate the technological warfare of drones and communications. France today is also on its own engaged in Mali, in Central Africa, and in Iraq. But at the same time, we must face the fact and that is the whole paradox of the situation, that these interventions all missed their political objective. Afghanistan was not stabilized, and the regime change from the Taliban to the secular rule of Hamid Karzai has not allowed any real penetration of democratic values or of the rule of law or even of basic security. Each time the tired troops leaves, Afghans feel they have overcome yet another foreign invasion. Time is on their side. In Iraq, the political objective was first the regime change towards democracy, and secondly, a regional domino effect. In reality, we have seen Iraq becomes a failed and fragmented state. Despite huge subsidies and massive recruitments, it was not able to build up any credible security force, and 20,000 fighters from ISIS could defeat a force of one million security forces until even Baghdad was about to fall. As far as the domino effect, the truth is the situation in Iraq has prevented the indigenous democratic wave of the Arab Spring to take roots in a deeply hurt and divided region where terrorists and Islamists have built up their forces for 10 years. Where did the democratic wave begin in 2011? In Tunisia, far away, because of education, because of the existence of national coherence. Where did the wave fail? In Syria, at the borders of Iraq. Political failure was also at the end of the road in Libya after 2011 because the foreign organized transition regimes were unable to take a grip on the country. Today, Libya is subject to a complicated and inextricable civil war in which Islamist militias are gaining ground day after day. Most of the country has fallen into anarchy and Libya today is not very different from all the other failed states. All interventions even created the need for new interventions. The use of force has always led to the destabilization of local societies and to the disruption of the state capacities, paving the ground for ethnic or religious rivalries and favoring the recruitment of the most radicals. The interventions have fueled anti-Western and anti-modernist feelings in Muslim societies because of arrogance, because of collateral damages of the military domination, people have felt even more humiliated. 
What is the situation in Iraq and Syria today? To say it bluntly, ISIS is the monstrous child of Middle Eastern politics. It is the child of the American-led intervention in 2003 that allowed a synthesis of resentments between ex-Baathist military personnel, Sunni tribe leaders, and fanatic jihadists. The occupation and reconstruction of Iraq worsened the local situation. The debatization policy inspired by the denazification of 1945 created gaps in the administrative capacities of the country that could not be filled. On the other side, it created a reservoir of well-trained and unemployed forces to be radicalized by Al-Qaeda and today by ISIS. It's at the same time the child of the American withdrawal in 2012, because the United States had to rely on a sectarian regime led by Nouri al-Maliki, who fostered fears and frustrations among the Sunni populations. It is also the child of another monster in the region, which is the Assad regime in Syria, which, which through 40 years of tortures and manipulations has radicalized its opposition to the point of barbarianism. Today, there are many components among the Syrian rebels, but how many can we count as potential Democrats anymore? 10% at most. It is finally the child of the irresponsibility of the regional powers, the Gulf monarchies who flooded the Middle East with money supporting Islamist movements, states who, like Turkey, had their own agendas. The presence of the Western powers for 60 years and more allowed them never to take responsibility. And the choice of Western powers to marginalize Iran through exclusion and sanctions since the Islamic Revolution in 1979 and even more since the nuclear program has created an imbalance in the region that allowed some regional actors to lead irresponsible policies. The interventions have shown the, incoher in the incoher incoherence of the West policy in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. It has been fighting two enemies at the same time, the authoritarian regime and the Islamist, and end up creating even more disorder. It intervened, it, it intervened militarily in Libya against a tyrannical regime with the best intentions to avoid massacres in Benghazi. Soon, the objective became regime change, but instead of developing democracy, it weakened what was left of the Libyan state and handed concrete power to Islamist militias, allowing the Libyan Sahara to become a safe haven for traffics and terrorist katibas. So because of Libya, the Western countries, France, felt compelled to intervene in Mali, where weapons and money from Libya empowered Tuareg militias and Islamist combat groups from ACME. Once the devil out, out of the box, the Western countries got scared and wished for stability, supporting a military coup in Egypt and an authoritarian regime quite similar to Osni Mubarak. We have here a pattern of failure. This means there must be a common cause and we have to find it if we want to avoid dangerous repetitions. The key to this failure is the spiral of force because this is what all interventions of the two last decades have in common. They were operation of force. Their objective was to destroy an enemy, not to create the conditions of peace on the ground. Their means was, were essentially of military nature. When did it begin? It was after 1991, with the conjunction of military hyperpower and the conscience of political powerlessness. It was a time of hyperpower. Never before had the military advantage of one superpower been so big. 25 years ago, the Berlin Wall was torn down. For 20 years, the United States have controlled almost half of the world's military expenses and over two thirds with their allies. As President Obama said, 
it's not because you have a hammer in your hand that every problem needs to look like a nail. Never before was the possibility of an international security system greater. 1990 was the crucial date when the Soviet Union of Gorbachev accepted to shift its strategy of systematic veto in the UN to vote in favor of an intervention against Saddam Hussein's Iraq after he divided Kuwait. The first Gulf War has been the first and only, even until today, war to be led with the legitimacy of the whole international community through the UN. But this common power has been misinterpreted as a victory of the United States against the Soviet Union, when it could have been a restart between the two countries and with the international community. It was also a time of a feeling of great powerlessness. It appeared that the Soviet enemy was not the only reason things weren't going right in the world. It appeared there were dark forces that were left. The massacre of Rwanda in 1994 and of Srebrenica in Bosnia in 1995 were a catastrophic experience of humanitarian powerlessness. This created a feeling of guilt and even anger. And even anger. The whole point of policies since then has been to say, at least we tried. It created a reflex of intervention and thus a pattern of military intervention fulfilling a political mission under the image constraint of domestic media and politics. Remember Benghazi, the red line of chemical weapons, the Yazidis in northern Iraq. Then in 2001, there was another catastrophe with 9-11. America felt powerless on its own soil more than it had in 70 years of direct confrontations. Powerless as a nation, the only possible cooperation was Pearl Harbor. This created fear and even resentment towards a world that was unable to accept the benevolent leadership of the United States. It legitimated expeditions abroad in the name of national security. It was used to legitimate a war on terror that had no been clearly defined with no specific enemy, no limit in time and space, and no possible peace. It was at the same time a war, a police operation, and a punishment. How did it happen? The logic of force expanded, expanded by bending the rules. But rules once bent by Western countries can, all, can also be bent by others, Russia today, maybe China tomorrow. International law has been broken because of a triple mistake on what responsibility meant after the fall of the Wall of Berlin. Responsibility has been mistaken for spirit of mission without check and balances. Responsibility has been understood as a right when we feel like it and not as a duty. This has created a logic of force of double standards. Why intervene in Libya and not in Ituri? Congo, in the Great Lakes region. Why such pressure on Russia and not pressure on other countries like Israel, for example? Responsibility has been understood as an exemption from control and not a source of more and better control. The superpowers were responsible only before themselves, as it is the case with weapons reduction, with climate change, with international penal law. International law has also been broken through a competition of norms. Self-determination of the people has been opposed to the intangibility of sovereign borders. It has been true in Kosovo after 1999, though with long prior negotiation with Serbia and a process involving the UN. It has been the case recently with Crimea, with the referendum of March 2014 and the integration in the Russian Federation. Responsibility to protect written into the UN Charter in 2005 has been opposed to non-interference in domestic affairs of a sovereign state in Libya and in Syria. International law was shattered because the feeling of urgency concerning national security after 9-11 led to set military interventions 
free from any legal, legal framework, even national laws. The legal situation of the enemy combatants in Guantanamo created a mass massive breach in the treatment of war prisoners, as did the secret, secret detention centers all over the world. The legalization of torture to collect intelligence also touched the whole architecture of international laws of warfare. The notion of preemptive war blurred the lines between self-defense and offensive wars. What will happen now? We are not here to argue about the past, but the fact is it's not going to get better. The changes of the world are making interventions of this kind more and more dangerous. Because of multipolarity first, there will be more and more hurdles for each intervention. The case of Syria in 2013 has proven it. France and America were willing to wage a direct military intervention in Syria in order to change the murderous regime of Bashar al-Assad after there seemed to be enough evidence that the regime was responsible for massive chemical attacks against its own population. This was a clear violation of the laws of warfare and as such could lead to an intervention with the support of the United Nations. But many countries did not want to back such an action because they had failed the change of mandate in Libya under Resolution 1973 as a betrayal. This was the case of China and Russia. We are in a world where many great powers feel they have been humiliated and they are seeking today recognition. It's true for Russia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. It's true for China after two centuries of weakness since the Opium Wars. Globalization is the second cause interventions will become even more dangerous. Because globalization develops interdependence and creates global repercussions for every local crisis. That's how thousands of Europeans can be attracted to Syria to become jihadists. It's true also of economic repercussions as we see with the sanctions in Russia or, or with the oil price. Because globalization weakens the states and creates social insecurity. Closed identities are the response to resist these doubts. They can be national, religious, or ethnic identities. The results are all the same. I would like to take us one step further in our interrogation. What is the problem today with democracies? We should look around us. The root of interventionism is not so much in the Middle East, but it's in our democracies, and it is democracy itself. Because democracy is the objective of these interventions through nation building and regime change. Some seem to think that democracy can be imposed by force. Because democracies are the only countries today that seem to feel responsible for the whole world. Because the functioning of modern democracies also explains why we are prisoner of this logic. The feeling of powerlessness in domestic politics creates a temptation for hard decisions abroad. It can be very reassuring for political leaders to feel that through the military, they can have the impression they take real decisions with concrete impact. The fragility of public opinions makes it difficult to pursue consistent policies. It leads to short-term decisions and to frequent turnabouts in policies that make diplomatic efforts inefficient. The impact of the media leads to favor visible and quick actions over long-term political strategies. The truth is there is a historic crisis of democracy. First, there is a new contestation of democracy in the world. For 10 years after 1989, according to Francis Fukuyama theory, we have believed in the end of history, where the institutions of liberal democracy and free market will triumph peacefully over all other systems after the fall of the Wall of Berlin. Then for 10 years after 9-11, many have believed that it was possible to convert whole countries to democracy either through force, like Iraq in 2003, or through ruse, 
like in Eastern Europe during the time of the color revolutions. But now we are seeing new political models rising who are making their force out of the weaknesses of democracies. We see it gaining ground in Russia, we see it gaining ground in China, and even in Turkey with Mr. Erdogan. It's a model with a strong personalization of power through intensive use of television as a key media. It's a model giving voice to strong feelings of national or religious identity in a time of major doubts. This explains the massive support of the people to such powers with approval rates at 80%. They are the exact opposite from those in modern democracies. It's a model which, in most cases, many formal resemblances with liberal democracies, in particular free elections. This is the model of Russia's sovereign democracies, which creates a broad appeal even within European public opinions. Secondly, there is a crisis within the democracies. Democracies have become powerless because partisan rule, the influence of big money, and the mass media have created a situation of rigid status quo. Particular interests have gained ground. In a time when global companies are more powerful than whole states, where are the limits between national power and private power? Let's take the concrete example of the technological monopoly of Google. Is it a monopoly in the interest of America, in the general interest of the users, in the private interest of the shareholders? You can be sure that these questions will only become more acute, more acute in years to come. The truth is, democracies are facing now the same dangers as the other states through the emergence of a global oligarchy. The greatest fortunes of this world are sharing the same way of life, the same ideology, the same aspirations, and it's naturally a challenge for democracy as well as for nation states. Democracies are contested in the name of democracy. All campus in America and Europe know it. But what has become of the questions and demands of the young people rising up in the last years? The indignados of the Puerta del Sol, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Maple Spring in Quebec, the students' movements in Chile, almost no reform, no new law. Why should they deserve less concrete change than the students of Occupy Hong Kong or those of Euromaidan in Ukraine. Democracies have also been fragilized by fear. The fear of insecurity and of terrorism has allowed more surveillance of the citizen and less respect for the fundamental rights of the individuals which are the cornerstone of all our democracies. Certainly, there is a structural transformation of democracies facing international conflicts. In a nutshell, democracies have converted to militarism. Democracies have engaged a war abroad against what they considered as barbaric. It's a permanent war. Against us, there is no organized state or organized army, only terrorists fighting in small groups, disappearing and reappearing again. There is no other outcome possible as the eradication of the terrorist, but this eradication of the terrorist is impossible to achieve through war because the war only entrenches hates and resentments and thus enables the terrorists to recruit more and more easily. It's a dehumanized war in which drones are taking more and more place. In the last years, casualties through Reaper drones have been evaluated to 3,000 a year but the number is rising fast. It's a total war that doesn't make a real difference between civilians and militaries anymore because terrorism has blurred the line and because bombing always lead to collateral damages for civilians. The legitimate respect of democracies for the life of each of its individual members, civilian or military, leads to accepting high casualties abroad to have the highest individual guarantee. Democracies have at the same time engaged in a strategic confrontation 
with all countries. They don't recognize as democratic. The flip face of the wish to convert countries to democracy is the will to condemn morally all states that are not full-fledged democracies, putting in fact on the same levels countries with very different historical situations. Russia has all the institution of democracy, while China doesn't want to have them, saying it takes the lesson of the perestroika, which destroyed the economy and state of the Soviet Union by changing too quickly. My point is to say that through all these interventions, we are in the long run putting democracy at risk. Today, there are three options concerning interventions. The first option is to continue intervening as it has been done with the argument it has to become worse until it gets better. But would you trust a doctor who would talk to you like that? That's the Bush years forever. The West will be more and more fragilized by its own mistakes and inconsistencies. The second option is isolationism, or at least withdrawal on a regional area of influence. That's maybe the shooting the Obama years all over again. The third option is to rethink our global responsibility in the world. It is to say to adapt interventions and to say that they are necessary, but we should think intervention of a new kind with a political vision. This is the task of our time. We have to reinvent diplomacy in the age of democracy. The first key to reinvent a democratic diplomacy is exemplarity within our countries. This means reforms to adapt our institutions to new threats, to new demands, to new situations. We need more direct democracy, in particular through the form of e-democracy, collective decision and deliberation in real time based on the participation of all citizens. We have seen initiatives in Europe in the last years, in Spain, in France, Switzerland, but much has yet to be done. We need also more representativity, more transparency, and more efficient in passing legislation. Democracy always remains unfinished work. We need more active citizenship to allow each member of our nations to feel recognized and useful for all. This means more vigilance when it comes to threat against individual freedoms. The citizens are the soul and body of democracy. There are, not, there are no lively institutions without citizens. More exemplarity means more people-to-people -people exchanges and diplomacy. We need to develop the natural links of friendship between democratic and open societies by developing the principles of free circulation and work among those countries that feel akin. We need to develop relationships and exchanges even more with the rest of the world because this is the way the influence of democracy will concretely progress as it did in the countries of the Eastern Bloc in the 70s and 80s. We must receive more and more exchange students from Asia. There are already 200,000 Chinese students in America. We need more links between think tanks to exchange views and ideas. In the long run, this is the best way to develop mutual understanding. It means also more cultural links, events, festivals, to let our societies be better known abroad. More exemplarity means more regional cooperation. In Europe, this is a vital necessity today. To be exemplary, we must demonstrate the capacity of democracy to create new forms of state-to-state -state cooperation. That's the whole point of the European integration since the Rome Treaty in 1957. We have to invent a new model of political processes. There is still a long way to go in Europe because of the sovereign debt crisis, the euro crisis, and today the spiral of deflation. We have to respond to the temptation of populism in France with the national front rising, but also everywhere in Europe. And this is something that can be felt here in America too. This means Europe must take the initiative to open up to its neighborhood and to believe in itself and in the power of its values to constitute a large pan-European zone in an evolving partnership with Turkey, Ukraine, Russia, and all North Africa. The second key to reinvent a democratic diplomacy is dialogue. Concerning Ukraine, we have nothing to win in a new Cold War. 
the Cold War logic will only confirm some Russians in their rejection of Western democratic standards. Sanctions, like always, will only further radicalize and victimize the country. We need a new Ost politic, like the policy of dialogue that began in 1970 when Willy Brandt became Chancellor of Germany. This policy allowed more exchanges with East Germany, more family contacts, and a stronger dialogue with Russia. With the restart proposed in 2008 by President Obama, much was hoped for, but did not come true in particular because of the situation in Georgia. Today, such a policy is needed in Ukraine, a failed state and a divided nation in between Russia and Europe. First, because Ukraine is a burden, neither Europe nor Russia can handle alone. Who will have the power to fight corruption in Ukraine? Who will vouch for the 300 billion euros the reconstruction of Ukraine will cost in the coming decade? Who will guarantee energy resources to Ukraine if relations with Russia are cut off? Secondly, because Russia and Europe do need each other. Russia is the main gas provider of Europe. Europe represents half of the exports of Russia. And there is a long history and culture between Russia and Europe from Peter the Great to the two world wars. This means creating a new tool and I advocate a permanent contact group between Russia, Ukraine, and the Weimar Triangle countries, that's to say France, Germany, and Poland, as well as with the United States and Great Britain. It should work at the same time and with a clear timetable on the different difficult issues. First one is the security guarantees for Russia concerning NATO as its borders. Second, the constitutional reform of Ukraine to take into account regional autonomy. Third, the economic recovery of Ukraine in coordination with the IMF, who granted and monitors already a 17 billion US dollar loan plan. Fourth, the state building in Ukraine in order to tackle corruption. Iran is another matter of concern today. After years of direct confrontation on the nuclear proliferation issue, President Obama, during his first term, wished to choose a new course through the negotiations. But this hope also, unfortunately, came at the wrong moment, with a breakdown on the Green Revolution in 2009. Today, the situation has radically changed. The political context has changed with the elections of the moderates of Hassan Rouhani and with his policy since 2013. The regional context has changed with the spreading of ISIS terrorism, which is, of course, a common threat from, for the Western world as well as for Iran. The global context has changed also with the empowerment of Russia and China, which can either create pressure in favor of a deal or block the West initiative more than before. Let's be clear. The negotiation is not so much about the nuclear bomb anymore. It is mainly about pride. Pride of the Iranians who wish to be recognized as a regional power and a great civilization, either through the nuclear program or through their relationship to the other powers of the region. Pride of many Western countries who are not always negotiating with efficiency in view, but sometimes to justify years and years of sanctions and hard works. Today, a technical deal is not difficult, but a political agreement is very difficult because the moderates in Iran are in a political corner and because the Republicans have come back to the Senate and are waiting new sanctions against Iran. We must aim next week, the last date for an agreement is the 24th of November, we must aim at a coherent and complete deal that will pave the way for a better cooperation through the partial lifting of sanctions. This will mean organizing in the months after the deal a regional conference to keep the momentum. If an agreement can be reached, which is quite probable, I'm afraid we must aim at a new interim agreement. To keep the channels of dialogue open, in no way will breaking up the discussion be a status quo. It will create a new spiral of distrust and conflict. We need regional dialogue, and this is true also in Asia. 
Asia has all the ingredients to be the key conflict zone of the 21th century. It's a conflict-ridden region where wounded memories are creating massive threats for the region between Japan, Korea, China. Old and unresolved issues are still vivid, even if there have been positive signs in the last weeks when President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe met in Beijing. It's a region whose growth and military capacities make stakes higher and higher as shown by the Japanese project to change the pacifist constitution to allow the creation of an army. It's a region where the two main powers, the US and China, will have to solve their tensions. We have seen signs of appeasement during the APEC forum this week, and I'm happy about it, but there is a lot of work ahead on cyber spying, on trade, on resources. China has defined a new strategy Leaving its low-profile strategy of Deng Xiaoping years, the Chinese dream of the new birth of the nation creates strong pressure on all of Eastern and Southern Asia. China is more and more taking up the role of the regional superpower, organizing the division of labor on cross-border capital flows and the infrastructure projects as shown by the One Road, One Belt strategy, creating a land and a maritime silk road of the 21th century with the recent foundation of an Asian infrastructure investment fund. It's trying to organize trade relations through the regional comprehensive trade partnership and the new Asian free trade zone against the competing project of the United States, the Trans-Pacific Partnerships. China is building up its national aspirations in part as a way to legitimate the central power in Beijing and to avoid the political breakup of the country. Military capacities are being built up quickly at a faster pace than the nation's growth and with an emphasis on the development of a modern navy and of force project projection capacities. Let me clear about this. Between America and China, there will be no middle course. It will be either confrontation or cooperation, but no indifference. That's why we need a permanent cooperation board, including the two main partners, but also the worldwide stakeholders in a new and anticipating concerts of nations. That's why we need solid regional integration based on principles and common interests in order to tighten economic interdependency that make direct confrontations less likely. ASEAN plus three with Japan, Korea, and China need today a kick restart, in particular in a context of rebalancing of economic growth, of wage increases in the region, and of internationalization of China's finance. The third key to reinvent a democratic diplomacy is global governance. Never has multilateral regulation been so weak than today. We witness the temptation of bilateral agreements between powers rather than multi multilateral agreements that seem almost impossible to reach. Look last week, the agreement between the United States and China on climate change. This is good news because it involves the two main stakeholders on climate change, but it could also lead to weaken the worldwide agreement on global warming that we are seeking since the end of the Kyoto Protocol five years ago. Multilateral agreements can give an opportunity for transparency and for general interest Why bilateral agreements tend to more secrecy and more bargains. Never has global regulation been so necessary as today. There are no national solutions to the main challenges. This is true for climate change and the recent report of the international expert groups on climate for the UN, which has reminded us last week that if we don't act now, we are jeopardizing the future of the coming generations. The crisis of 2008 has taught us that financial stability can be achieved only on a global scale. But the G20 has failed in implementing a thorough regulation because of national interest. Shadow banking is again as high as before the crisis of 2008. There is a new financial crisis looming ahead because of the financial bubbles in China 
or on student loans here in America, because of austerity and deflation in Europe, because of the situation in the emerging markets at the end of the QE policy of the Fed. The development of a new global oligarchy and the problem of tax havens proves that there is no solution to social inequalities on a national level either. So should we say that only global taxes could one day decrease the level of inequalities? To achieve this regulation effort, we need an architecture, a new architecture of global governance. We need the United Nations to become more representative. The five permanent members of the Security Council embody the world of 1945. We need today permanent representatives from all continents, from Latin America, from Africa, from the Middle East. It's a condition for the legitimacy of the decisions that will have to be taken. We need the global institutions to become more efficient too. The reform of the IMF that was passed in 2010 was a step forward to build up trust with the emerging countries. But unfortunately, the reform is still blocked by a vote of the American Congress. The IMF's mandate should also extend, in my view, to currency stability to avoid many crises. But this will mean developing new global currency units instead of the dollar as only true currency reserve today. We need an overhaul of international law to overcome the crisis of interpretation and conflict of norm that has arisen in the last 20 years. This means reinforcing the procedures of international arbitrage that have proven useful and peaceful this year between Peru and Chile and in, in a century-long dispute. For the territorial dispute in the China Seas, this could be a good news. The fourth key is strategy and initiative. We must take the risk of politics again. We need political strategy concerning the hot crisis of this world. Action is always better than reaction. In Syria and Iraq today, we need a political strategy to asphyxiate ISIS. They have revenues, they have support, they have sponsors, they have prestige. Let's work on all these points. We must asphyxiate ISIS financially by blocking the oil wells, by fighting against the traffics, by stopping all financing from regional sponsors in the Arabic world. We must asphyxiate ISIS politically through an inclusive government in Baghdad, and if possible, through discussions with all regional powers like Turkey, Iran, Russia, also in Syria. The Sunni populations need a sense of security and of respect to turn their back to ISIS. Instead of an American-led coalition, we should have a regional coalition with the support of the Western countries. We must asphyxiate ISIS militarily by containing their military expansion. This has been done in the last months by the United States with the help of France, Great Britain, although there, have been, there, ha there has not been enough anticipation on the next hot spots like Jordan or Lebanon. We need more regional responsibility on this issue. We need concrete progress on local peace in order to work on a global peace. This is the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Pressure, we see it every day, is growing. We see it with the rising tensions in Israel and Palestine, in Gaza this summer, in East Jerusalem today, where the risk of a third intifada is high. We see it with the recognition of the state of Palestine by European Parliament in Sweden, in Great Britain, very probably soon in France next week. We need an imposed peace today while the two countries, Palestine, two states, Palestine and Israel, are not able to do this work alone because there are no partners for peace anymore on any side. There is a process of mutual radicalization that can lead in the end as John Kerry has pointed out, only to some sort of apartheid. Peace should be imposed within the framework of the Oslo Agreement with two states and a strong interposition and administration force of the United Nations. We need an accumulation of local peace to hope for a regional and even more for a global peace. ISIS is prospering on the resentment of the identities and communities 
Nowhere else in the world are there so many security fences and walls. Before we can eradicate Islamist terrorism, we need peace between Kurds and Turks, peace between Shia and Sunni in Iraq, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Lebanon, peace between Berber populations and Arab populations in Morocco or Algeria, appeasement between Morocco and Algeria on the, on the issue of Western Sahara, appeasement between Saudi Arabia and Qatar within the peninsula, appeasement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, because this is the major strategic rivalry in the region today. We need to finish new tools. Diplomatic intervention is like surgery. It needs protocols, it needs tools, it needs teamwork, but before all, it needs experience. This means multi-dimensional strategies. We must articulate the different capacities we have in order to use them properly. Look at what happened in Iraq, where the military was facing the difficulties on the ground. They took over politics because they knew from their own eyes that there will be no solution through sheer force. General Petraeus, with the surge, became the driving diplomatic and political force in a crisis that had come out of control of politics. He tried to develop ties with the Sunni tribes. This means also new tools in favor of peace. From my experience, I have learned that we never have the right tools for quick and efficient intervention. National forces are most, mostly slow and unadapted to specific operations abroad, and the peacekeeping missions of the UN have shown the limits in the last decades because of their training, their command, and their mandate. I believe that democratic countries should among themselves decide the creation of a peace force, a permanent fast reaction force with common training and a common staff that will be put under the authority of the United Nations for very specific missions. I also strongly believe that we need to go beyond the violence of conflicts. We should treat the disease and not only the symptom. This means we need a state building capacity, allowing to cure the failed states through long and complete programs, focusing on the fight against corruption, on a coherent tax system, on security forces, and on representative institution with respect for the rights of local minorities. With these new tools, with these new strategic and political visions, our democracies will be able to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. To conclude, I would like to insist on the fact that a peaceful world needs before all respect of identities and of cultures. We see the world through the emotional eye of the media when we need more historical, more geographical, more cultural depths to seize this new world. We must embrace the complexity of the world, and that is the crucial role of universities in our democracies. Thank you very much. Ben, thank you so much for those insightful and thought-provoking remarks. Um, we are here at the University of Chicago where the opportunity presents itself for many of those in the audience, especially students, to ask questions of you in response to your remarks. And as Eve mentioned at the outset, we are joined across the Midwest by many French citizens and Francophiles in Minneapolis and Milwaukee, Kansas City and Lawrence, Kansas. So we'll be taking their questions throughout the evening on this device as well. Um, we have two microphones, one to the left and one to the right. So I would invite those of you who have questions for Monsieur Vipin to uh, line up accordingly and we'll try to get to as many of you as possible. As we do that though, I'd love to begin the questioning for you as, as a follow-up. Um, there's much that you've talked about in terms of the need for international cooperation, the need for greater multinational networks, for cultural exchanges and understandings, um, to create a safer world, a better world. And yet, I think the question still presents itself, what do you do about those bad actors? 
And under what circumstances would a military intervention, in your view, be something that should be considered? I really believe that a military intervention should be the last uh, possibility we should consider. And it should be very well crafted, um, very punctual, and most of all, it should be seen within a global strategy. Most of the military intervention I decided uh, with a feeling of urgency, but without any vision of what should be done the day after. It was very interesting to see uh, how uh, the United States went into war with Iraq. Uh, the idea of having the regime of Saddam Hussein out was very clear. But what should, do, what should you do and what should we do with Iraq after the military intervention? There was no idea of what should be done. There was a dream of having a democracy in Iraq, but uh, that was only a dream. There was a dream of going in the Middle East through Baghdad and to finish after making peace in Jerusalem. But that was the dream of the neocons. That democracy would spread throughout the region. Democracy would spread by the use of force. The mistake was first to not realize what kind of country was Iraq. Iraq uh, is not only an important and old state in the region, but it's a nation with a culture, a civilization. It was Babylon. Uh, a long time ago. And it was considered as really one of the biggest center in the Middle East. So to go with military force in such a country has a very special meaning for the Middle East. And I always say when you want really to seize whether a military, a military intervention uh, can be efficient or not, you have always to look through the eyes of the people who are concerned. You have to look at the TV in the Middle East. If you look at Al Jazeera at the time, you were not seeing the same images that you were seeing here. You were not seeing the same scenarios, not the same perspective. And even if on your TV you were seeing some uh, people applauding and saying uh, uh, hello to the liberators, that was not the general feeling in the Middle East. And very couple of days after, for many people in this region, the U.S. intervening in Iraq were occupying forces. The same happened in Afghanistan. And you have to understand that strong identities is the real characteristic of our world. And there is always strong reaction of the people to that kind of intervention. So it should be always limited in time, should be very punctual, should be uh, really aimed at a very specific movement. For example, and, and I criticize also, quite strongly the, the military, French military intervention in Mali, I can understand we can use the military to stop uh, the progress of, uh, a of, of an army. But stopping an army doesn't mean you are going to send thousands of troops in a country. You can stop the army with aircraft and bombs in a very short period of time. But then you must have a political strategy being supported by the state you are helping, by the regional powers. So it means really to put first a political strategy and the military approach should always be just on the side, a way to help, you know, a way to clarify, not the main, uh, the, the, main, uh, uh, the main force that you are going to use. And you think the same thing would be true in Syria as well? Of course, of course. Uh, the more complex the situation, the more difficult to intervene, uh, with uh, military option. Even if today military ex can explain that uh, they can make the distinction in a map between the, this house here and the other house here, you, we know that every time you use the military, you have collateral damages. And if you are going to kill a very important terrorist, but you are going also to kill uh, two, three civilians, some uh, young boys and girls, a school just near the target, really the, the collateral damages are going to create such uh, a feeling in the country, such repercussions in the country, that you are going to miss your, your objective on the long run. So we should integrate the perception of the military in the region itself. There are many more questions, certainly, that I have. I know that some of you have questions as well. We have uh, several folks lining up on the right side and on the left. I want to take one, though, from 
a viewer in Milwaukee, Claude, as a follow-up in some respects to this, says, taking a look at just the many challenges in the Middle East right now, from Egypt all the way up through Iraq and Syria. Some observers to the crisis, um, Claude writes, have made suggestions that the international community should revamp the borders and think much more differently about um, how we're even looking at nation states here. What's your opinion of that? This is a very difficult question because uh, we have uh, uh, several principles that have uh, uh, organized the, the world uh, in the last decades. And one, which is very important, is the respect of the borders through decolonization. If we are going to reconsider this, we are entering in a vicious circle that is going to create much turmoil, much uncertainties. Look what is going on in Sudan, to Sudan. OK, where do you stop? If you are going to have for each tribe, each ethnic uh, entity, a new state, you, you are going to have a hundred of states in Africa, for example. So we should have rules, respected rules, and we should be very careful in not changing these rules every two or three years, because then there is no way you can stop this division of states. We have today a divided Iraq. We have uh, three parts in Iraq. We have a divided Syria. We have a divided Libya, three parts in Libya also. You can go on and on. And, and this spirit of division is going to grow everywhere. And it's the same in Europe. Why Scotland should not be independent? Why Catalonia should not be independent? Why Corsica should not be independent? You see, you are going to completely change the map, create new aspiration and new frustrations. So I think we should stick to a certain rule. And I think the borders of the colonization have been the rule until today. And they should stay the rule. That, that relates to what you've written in the past, that we're not looking just at a crisis, but a, and not just a clash of civilizations, but a clash of identities, that's, which, that's which the precipitates that's a lot the of key. Yeah. Yes, that's let's, the key. Let's take a question from this side of the room here at Mandelhof. Yes. Hi. Uh, is this on? Yes. Uh, I was wondering whether you would compare the rise of the ISIS in the Middle East due to uh, civilian resentment to the rise of the Viet Cong in uh, northern Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Well, I think it's, it's very different. Uh, the Viet Cong was fighting for the independence of, of Vietnam. Uh, ISIS is, uh, at the origin, a terrorist group, which is fighting to create a new entity, the Caliphate, um, without respecting any type of tradition, any type of borders, and uh, not asking for a specific state. So it's not the takeover of an old state. It's a complete change in, in the situation of the Middle East. Uh, we should take into account also that uh, ISIS is not respecting any rule, neither the rule of war, neither um, political objective. Uh, the, the main objective of ISIS is violence to create more support within the Middle East among uh, Muslim population. So we have to consider the fact that ISIS is a terrorist group with terrorist objective, while Viet Cong the same as FLN in Algeria, was having a, 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 the strategy of a group of liberation in order to get the independence of Vietnam in one case, of Algeria in another case. Of course, the similarity is the fact that at the time, we were calling, we the French and you after the United States, we were calling the Viet Cong as terrorists, as well as we were calling the FLN as terrorists. But again, this was a totally different situation or when part of the world was not decolonized, which is not the case in Syria and Iraq. You have real independent state in Syria, real independent state in Iraq. So the, the, the willingness of IC is to create a new entity, a new entity with a terrorist approach and not respecting any kind of rules of international law. Let's take a question from this side of the room. Go ahead and step up to the microphone and identify yourself if you would, please. Uh, so, some have argued that uh, Assad may have had a role in propping up ISIS in order to divert national, international attention to a new threat. I was wondering what you thought of this idea. Merci beaucoup. Didn't catch the question. Um, he, he didn't catch the question. Just repeat the central oh, sure. part of that as well. Um, some have argued that uh, Assad may have had a role in propping up ISIS in order to divert international attention to a new threat in order to protect his regime against the Western world. I was wondering what your perception of this was. Uh, I think that uh, 
ISIS is uh, a new, it's, it's, it's a new threat I I in the world. We have not experienced that kind of threat, uh, the willingness to have a terrorist group creating a state in the Middle East, um, willing to uh, dominate the whole region, and uh, trying to use cruelty as a way of recruiting and getting more and more support in our countries. When you think that in a country like France, uh, we have a, a strong and important Muslim community, the same in the UK or in Germany, the attraction toward this kind of movement because of its cruelty, its violence, uh, can be very strong. And the more you give uh, recognition to such a group, the more you give attention to such a group, the more publicity you give to them. That's why I always believe that war on terror was a stupid concept. Uh, you cannot give recognition to terrorists of any kind. Terrorist is not a partner in war. Uh, it's like uh, in, in a boxing uh, combat. Uh, you cannot recognize the legitimacy of a terrorist group. That's why you should use different means, different ways in order to fight efficiently uh, a terrorist group. You should use cooperation, secrecy, um, financial tools, uh, a, a strong combination of, of tools, but not make of the terrorist a target which might give them publicity, recognition, and, and they might use that they are using the media, the social networks against us. So we should be very careful in the way we are handling this question. But do you think that Assad used ISIS to divert attention and to prop I, up I the I believe stand. that Assad has used, at the beginning, these terrorist groups, whether it's al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria. But uh, Assad understand now that uh, he's facing a very strong risk coming from ISIS. So I think ISIS uh, is, is, a, is such a scale of danger that even Assad today is very much aware of the risk for his regime. Uh, let me take a question also about the Middle East from Kansas City. This comes from Gary, who asks if you believe that with the supreme leader's power in Iran, if he has any serious interest or any interest in any, at any level in reconciliation or coexistence with Sunni Gulf or Middle East nations. Um, what's your sense of, of the Iranian well, I, endgame? I, I, I know well Iran. I have been many times in this country. I've been negotiating the, the, the first and only agreement we had with Iran in the last years. And I really believe that we have a fantastic opportunity today. And uh, maybe the only good news for the region is to reintroduce Iran. We need Iran in order to solve the, the situation in Iraq. We need Iran in order to solve the Syrian crisis. We need Iran in order to have a different approach of the peace process between Israel and Palestine. So uh, I believe having Iran on board, giving a perspective to the Iranian people as well as the Iranian leadership might convert them and change them in giving them a, a, a much more pragmatical approach because of economic interest, because of their willingness to develop the country. So I think the reintegration of Iran in the region is very important. The more we will put Iran on the side, the more dangerous Iran might be for the region as well as the world community. I would say the same for many countries, the same in our relationship with Russia. You have never interest in putting aside a country. Because if you put aside a country, you have to take into account the fact that the support in this country coming from the population is inducing radicalization. And if we miss this opportunity to have an agreement on the nuclear issue with, the, with Iran, we must radicalize the regime. And we may not have, before many years, another opportunity uh, to, to settle the situation with them. Of course, we should not buy an agreement, a cheap agreement. Uh, but I believe that today, all the technical elements are on the table for a good agreement on the nuclear. Whether we are talking about the number of centrifuges, whether we are talking about the level of enrichment, whether we are talking about the time that Iran will need to be able to make a bomb. Uh, and I think today we have all the technical elements to have this good 
agreement. And do you think an agreement will come? Well, I think uh, the difficulty, uh, and that's what I was trying to explain, the difficulty today is do we have enough leadership in Europe, in the US, and in Iran to be able to stand and sign this agreement? In the US, you have a political situation that you know better than me, but the Republicans are very strongly against this agreement. Is Barack Obama able to face such political uh, opposition? In Europe, the same, uh, with strong support uh, for uh, Israel in many countries. Uh, and because of the tension in, in Israel and in, in the Palestinian territory, are we able to force an agreement and then to create a dynamic that will be favorable to a peace process in the region. So it's a difficult uh, decision, but it's a political decision. I don't think today we are missing anything to sign on the technical aspect of the nuclear agreement. Let's take a question from this side of the room. Yes. Thank you very much for your insightful speech today. Come closer if you don't mind uh, to the microphone. And um, my, my question is, so when you're making a claim or uh, argument against regime change with the use of force, would it be because just like democratic or liberal values cannot be achieved with the use of force, or it, would it be because the intervening countries are not consider, considering the domestic conditions enough? Which side, it, uh, which, which one would be your side? Um, say, say that again, if you, are, you're saying um, a, a, about the decision not to intervene, which is the more powerful determinant? Yeah. Um, and, and say those again too, so um, Mr. Vipan. Can... So when you're making your argument against the democratization with the use of force, would it be because the intervening countries are not considering domestic conditions of the target state enough, or would it be because just um, those kind of liberal or democratic values cannot be achieved with the use of force? Well, I think we, we first we should uh, make a little history. Uh, we should remember that uh, the democratic process is a long process. It has been a long process in Europe. It has been a long process uh, here. Uh, you cannot decide from one day to another uh, to be a democratic country. Uh, and second, you cannot impose democracy through force. So we should be very careful to create a path in which we are going to help a country to go forward and to create democratic mechanism and to get a democratic spirit. I think uh, it's not by judging, it's not by giving lessons every day that we are going to, to change things and to favor democracy. Exemplarity is a much more convincing aspect. If, for example, uh, the consensus in our countries, if our capacity to go forward uh, to fight against inequality in our countries was successful, we should be much more convincing for Chinese or for Russians. The, the problem is we are facing crisis in our countries. We are facing inefficiency in our countries. We are facing today an incapacity to change the course of history, to invent new mechanisms, to uh, create new institutions. So democracy looks very much today as a rhetoric a way to give lessons to the Russian, give lessons to the Chinese, and they look at us and say, okay, but uh, for the Chinese, look at our economy. We have a 7.2 or 3 of growth. We are able to go forward and you are stuck into recession for the Europeans, or you are stuck facing difficulties in your country. You have to feel that when we are talking about this country uh, on our TVs, for example, uh, we are showing images of uh, problems that they are facing, social problems, uh, unrest in this country. But when they are looking at our country, they, will, they, are, they are showing images of what uh, is happening in our cities, uh, gunfighting, uh, um, social unrest, the same. So their vision is also a vision of democracy with many, many problems. Democracy with incapacity to solve problems. When there was the, the decision uh, or, the, or the difficulty that Barack Obama has been facing with uh, the, the administration that was not able to pay uh, for uh, uh, last year. Of course, when you look at these issues from Russia or from China, you have the feeling that democracy don't work. 
So we have to be much more uh, sensitive to our own difficulties. We must be much more efficient if we want to go forward and, uh, and create another uh, positive democratic process. I want to stay for a second with China and Russia. You and I had the chance to chat a bit last night. Um, you're in China on average uh, once a month. You were just in Russia with Vladimir Putin. Um, you said about both countries, as if you alluded to here, that, that the West continues to misread the situation for the reasons you mentioned. Um, and, and that we are, in some respects, I don't want to put words in your mouth, clueless about how to deal with each of these two powers. Um, what needs to happen? How should we change um, the state of play as it relates to Putin in Russia and Xi Jinping in China? First, we should always consider keeping the dialogue. I think, just to take an example, uh, we decided after the Ukrainian crisis to stop the dialogue in the G8. I think this is a strong mistake. If you are only going to put forward aggressive and negative response like sanctions, you should consider that in these countries, we have a strong nationalist uh, attitude. Uh, you might have good economic results, putting constraints on this country, but you are going to have very negative political results because you are going to uh, create more unity of the country against you, more support to the leaders. Vladimir Putin has never been so powerful in Russia because there's nothing that a country likes less than interference. Yeah, than being I told what to do. I remember Spain, which is a great democratic country today, at the end of Franco, uh, Franco had decided to kill several people in, in the center plaza of Madrid. And uh, the rejection of the international community has been very strong. But all the Spanish unite themselves to support Franco. It was at the end of Franco. So we have to understand that because of feeling of identity, people hate interference. They don't like anybody to mix in their own affairs. So it's not to us to only send negative messages. We should try to put things differently. We should much more uh, try to create more perspective for the country so they can understand that they could benefit from ourselves. For example, I think today we should have a modern project of new security of Europe. I don't believe that uh, the attitude of NATO in the last decades has been wise. Since the Bucharest summit, uh, the position of NATO has been very aggressive towards Russia, and Russia has the feeling of containment. The US and the Europeans trying to put pressure on its borders. So in order to fight against this strategy, we should propose new forums a new uh, strategic forum for security. Eliminating NATO and, and a new no, forum no, that includes Russia? I don't Russia? mean eliminating, but I mean proposing new forums in order for them to be able to discuss and create trust. When you have difficult situation, when you have tensions, you need to create trust. This is the, the, the precondition for any kind of uh, prospect, any kind of agreement. So create trust for security, create trust for more economic cooperation. This is the only way to go forward. Of course, you should be more clear about your principles, but we have to understand that uh, in the case of Crimea, for example, which is a very interesting subject, uh, Russia has been using the same argument that we have been using on Kosovo. We've been supporting the independence of Kosovo, saying self-determination of the Kosovo people. And then they came after saying, well, self-determination of the Crimean people, and they want to be with the Russians. So we have always to consider that uh, principles can be used on one side, but also on another side. So we should be very careful in the way we are deciding uh, support in one case or not in another case. Let's take a question from you, yes. Hi, my name is Anthony Bucci, and I study international relations here. Um, I had a question about your view of the United Nations Security Council and how you, how you plan on, or how the new vision of it that you laid out in your speech 
would be practically reached, as you can tell today, it, it, and even based on some of the people who are here in the audience who study international relations, it would seem almost irrational for some states to uh, give up their permanent status if we were to adopt your um, one permanent member per continent model. Uh, I mean, France and the UK, for example, would there only really be one? Um, so how, how do you see this practically happening from the inside of the UN, or would it take uh, communication between the parties? How would it happen? Thank you. Well, first, I think we should realize that we need more global governance. Uh, I think democracies have, do, are facing uh, national, a big problem of national governance. Our institutions, uh, I speak mainly for France and Europe, but our institutions are too weak. We have very little capacity of fast and, and efficient decision. The same concerning regional governance. I think to have a, a stable order, a stable international order, we need more national governance, more regional governance, and more global governance. Concerning the UN, we have to face the fact that the Security Council today is unable to solve any crisis of the world because of the division between the permanent members. Um, the US and the Europeans might be willing something, Russia will oppose, because they don't trust each other. This started to be a very strong issue with the Libyan crisis. Russians have agreed to support the resolution, which has been voted with the responsibility to protect in Libya. But the French, the British, the US, many other countries have decided to go beyond the resolution and to support regime change in Libya, which I think was stupid. Stupid and dangerous. The situation of Libya is worse today than it used to be under Gaddafi. So the question is how to recreate trust. I think nobody can accept such inefficiency at the level of the Security Council. So we need a reform. The question is, who is going to accept the changes? I believe that you can keep the five permanent members and have five more permanent members if you consider that you should go until 25 members in this Security Council. The question is, who should have the veto? I think this is the difficult question. I think you could keep the five permanent members and consider that among the five new members, new permanent members, each of them or two of them might have a turning right to get the veto. Each year, one or two could have a veto. So that will be six or seven members with the veto. Might be a position uh, that will change the functioning of the Security Council. The question is, should we be able to veto in every circumstance? I think we should consider a certain number of situations in which the veto would not be uh, uh, accepted. So uh, I think we need rules. They are delicate to, to, to write, but I think we need new rules. And it is possible to get, uh, to, to get a consensus on these issues if we do the hard work that needs to be done. We're running short on time this evening, so we have time for just one more question. And uh, as a way to frame it, I, I can't help but note that as we sit here talking, we do so just three days after Armistice Day on the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I and the many, certainly, um, uh, historical forces that shaped that and then followed. And this question comes from Minneapolis and from Jude, and it's thinking about terrorism. And, and the question really is about a Marshall Plan uh, for the global fight against terrorism. What are your thoughts on that concept as an instrument? Well, I'm not sure that the biggest issue uh, to fight terrorism is money. Uh, a Marshall Plan, that means more money to fight uh, terrorists. I think the real problem uh, to face terrorism today is more political. Uh, you have, uh, in many regions of the world, a lot of ambiguities uh, facing terrorism. Uh, for example, uh, in Afghanistan, we have been facing strong ambiguities coming inside Pakistan uh, towards uh, the terrorists. In uh, the Middle East, we are facing a lot of ambiguities on the sunny side, conservative monarchies of the Gulf, who 
who are not very clear on whether they support uh, different groups, radical groups, that might use terrorism as a weapon. We have to consider the fact that many countries are buying in this region their security by giving money to these groups. If you are a country in this region and you are afraid to have a bombing in your city that would create disruption, fear, when will kill the, the economy and tourism, you will, of course, uh, be concerned and, and you might be tempted to give money to these groups in order to, to, to make sure that nothing is going to happen in your country. So there are a lot of different reasons that um, explain why the fight against terrorism is not uh, as effective as it should because the cooperation between countries is full of ambiguities, full of uncertainties, and a lot of countries are not doing what they should. Uh, but the I idea of getting at sort of the source conditions that breed it, the lack of economic opportunity, um, the, the, the sense of um, disconnection from power yes, sectors. But, but we have to understand what is the mechanism yeah. of terrorism today. And I think that if we consider that the main source for terrorism is injustice. Feeling of injustice is crisis. Every time you have a crisis, it's like a wound. You might be infected. Terrorism is an infection of a wound. So if you uh, make sure that every time you have a problem, you are going to solve it, you are not going to have any terrorist capacities. If you solve tomorrow uh, the crisis between Palestine and Israel, you are killing a little bit, uh, uh, a lot of these groups in the region. If you solve the problem in Syria, they won't have any capacity to spread. There were no terrorists in Iraq before the American intervention in 2003. What creates terrorism is wound, injustice, feeling of not being well treated. And the terrorists are using this feeling of the population to be strong. They are using the, 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 this feeling of injustice to recruit in Europe Muslims in the Muslims community or uh, converted Muslims. So I think we should take into account all these elements in order to fight terrorism, in order to create a real consensus among our societies to be efficient against terrorism. But the first thing is to put everyone in front of its responsibility. If we were going to have a strong alliance of the region against terrorism, that would mean making sure that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Emirates, Kuwait, are going to be very clear on their views, on their policy, on their support towards these groups. It's not clear today that all, every of these country is doing what it should. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that the American-led coalition is receiving the help of many of these countries, but it's a very homeopathic help. They help homeopathic. with one plane, one, uh, one nurse, but this is not really support. I believe they should be in front. They should be doing the job. And we should be backwards, helping them with advice, with support, but they should be doing the job. You should imagine that uh, during the whole war in Afghanistan, the whole intervention of the Western world in Afghanistan, who was doing the job? The US, France, Great Britain, the Australian, None of the neighboring countries was part of the group of countries doing the job on the ground. Not Russia, not India, not Pakistan, uh, not China. These countries were looking at us, just looking, watching. And I'm not sure all of them were very happy when things were turning right. And I know that some of them were quite happy when things were turning bad. So the first thing is to commit the people that are first concerned, to make sure that everyone is doing the job. So every time you are doing the job for someone else, you are putting yourself in a difficult situation. And that's why I really believe that we should do it a different way. For example, having it at the level of the UN, a rapid or a fast reaction force that can intervene in very specific places, in very specific moments, I think that's useful. But to send troops, to send advisors in this country, I don't think it's useful. I'm 
just going to tell you a very short anecdote. When I arrived as foreign minister, just a couple of weeks after I was nominated in 2002 in Afghanistan, I was received by Amit Karzai, very well-dressed gentleman, president of Afghanistan. And I was very surprised because every guy around him was without any hair, military, all white people, all Americans, all Marines. How can you have any credibility to be the president of a country when your own security is done by a foreign country? It's impossible. When you know the third world, when you know these countries where identity is so strong, if you need foreign troops to make your security, that means your legitimacy is not strong. That means that you are working with a foreign country. And this kills every ability that you will have to do anything in your own country. So the first thing is to have the people doing their job in their country. And every time we choose, we pick up somebody that is friendly to us to be the president of this country. Uh, we were not happy with Mubarak. We've been supporting Mubarak for decades. And now we are supporting Marshal al-Sisi after a coup d'etat. If you're Egyptian, you're looking at them and say, oh, this country is, they say they're democratic and they're supporting a guy who is a general coming from a coup d'etat? What is the logic? What is the morale in this? And, and the same in many other countries, in Africa and elsewhere. We have double standards. We look at our interest and we put forward democracy. But it's a very hypocrite approach. We should be more consistent. We should be uh, really uh, more uh, in search of what is agreeable, what is understandable by the country and the people of these countries. Mr. Viben, I want to thank you so much for your insights, for your candor, and your thought-provoking analysis of the world's situation today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you here and a great pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank you so very much. And, and please join me in welcoming and in uh, thanking Steve Edwards as well for being here. Thank you, Steve. It's very painful, I think, to all of you here, but especially to me to have to put an end to such a fascinating conversation. Uh, you will be able to see this uh, conversation again online on our website, uchicagofrenchclub.com, as well as on uh, politics.uchicago.edu, the IOP's website. So thank you again, all of you, for coming out tonight. Thank you, Steve, and especially thank you, Monsieur Dominique de Villepin.